How's it going, James? It's uh, great to get you on the podcast. You know, I'm uh, really looking forward to our conversation today. I think you have some really interesting experience. Well, uh, happy to be here. And uh, it's fun talking at directory. So you, uh, you might have to get me to shut up at some point. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I can't go that deep on Active Directory. I mean, I, I guess I can. I guess I know more than the average person. But when we start talking about like nesting groups and stuff like that, it's just it's going to start getting difficult. <laughs> well, there's there's plenty of complexity there, and and one of the issues that's it's happening right now is a lot of the people that learned Active Directory in their 30s and 40s, you know, 20, 25 years ago, are rolling out of the workforce. They're they're retiring. They're, uh, you know, getting a nice home in Florida or, you know, just going going back to wherever they're living now and just having free time. And uh, the news generation isn't learning Active Directory because it's kind of seen as this dead technology that's not going to be around in 10 or 20 years. But it, it absolutely will be at any any large entity because getting away from it is is very, very difficult. Uh, Blue Lemon tried to do this relatively recently. Very, very aggressive planning. And they ended up having to stay partially on-prem, and now they have all those on-prem costs still there, along with the migration costs. So, you know, there's there's a toll to pay if you don't make it all the way. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've always felt like Active Directory is one of those, like, essential technologies, you, you know, that you, you just, you have to live with. You know, it's something that, you know, makes your business run, so to speak. Um, and if you don't, if you don't have it, it becomes a huge undertaking um, and stress on your environment just because, you know, the, the like you need an entire team of people to manage that custom solution or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 interesting from a security standpoint, too, because when Active Directory came on the scene, it was competing against itself with the uh, NT40 servers and basically Novell Network were the only, uh, you know, relatively large players in, in the game. And we had a uh, financial institution in China relatively recently um, that, that was compromised. But the, the hackers ransomware code didn't work because they weren't using Active Directory. They're still on Novell Network. So uh, they were able to catch the intruders and uh, remove them from the system with very limited damage because they were running like, uh, you know, 30 year old technology at their bank. <laughs> oh, so they took how... the Battlestar Galactica approach to security. <laughs> that's uh, it's an interesting perspective or a route to take, I guess, in security. I don't think well, it was intentional. <laughs> right. You know, Jim or James, you know, how how do you get how did you get this experience with AD? You know, because I, I feel ah. like you have unique experience that not everyone is going to have, even, you know, nowadays. Right. When we when we're talking about AD and people, you know, kind of owning it or teams owning it, you know, it sounds like you have a pretty unique experience with it. Well, I was doing uh, you know, system administration work back in like 99, 2000, effectively, you know, keeping the servers up and running, you know, hardware, software at a, a smaller entity uh, in, in Downriver, Detroit. And so I got to touch a lot of things because it's a small shop and there's only two of us. So we got to do basically everything from from networking, literally running cables across uh, drop tiles to hardware rack and stacking to the the logical networking and logical system deployments and you know IT looked a lot a lot different back in like 2000 2001 it's not the not the same shop most most entities didn't immediately adopt active directory in 2000 but once 2000 rolled around everyone saw the the advantages to it and I certainly did as well and and jumped on it cuz before you you had kind of a, a kludgy netware deployment or you had a bunch of NT4 servers all over the place, you know, sitting underneath people's desks at branch offices. And sometimes the, the cleaning people come in and turn them off. Like it was, it was bad. It was real bad. But with AD, it was like the first really large commercially replicated database. So you could, you know, hire someone in in New York. And if they flew to Los Angeles, they'd still be able to log in with their computer without any administrative overhead. And that was kind of like this, this new concept at the time. It was like this wild new way to auth. That didn't exist. And now we kind of take off for granted, right? You can you can cloud off from anywhere. It's just always there. So it's not a big deal. So uh, yeah, I, I guess being being around for a long time kind of helps there from the experience standpoint. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's uh it's interesting. So when I was working for a credit bureau, 
Um, you know, I, I owned a privilege access management solution. And a part of that was obviously getting all of the accounts and AD into the solution and eventually rotating them via the solution. Uh, it sounds like a great idea, you know, from a security perspective, um, but it adds in huge amounts of risk to the environment. If that PAM solution is not doing what it should be, or there's bugs and things like that. And so, you know, literally, um, you know, one day, you know, my manager said, Hey, we need to put global AD into this PAM solution. Never heard of global AD. I had no clue what it is. Right. And I go talk to our AD guy and he goes, Oh, that's a legacy like AD architecture that we basically can never get rid of because once you started it, you know, you basically can't, can't migrate away from it. Like it's almost impossible. So yeah, you're kind of trapped trapped in it forever because all the apps you buy integrate with it for its off store and you're, you're stuck with it. Right. Like for yeah. better or for worse, like at the hip, didn't mean you're up there, man. Sorry. No, no worries. And, uh, you, you know, I, I'm being the security person that I am, I'm trying to gauge the risk to the environment, right? What's the risk of adding these, you know, 12 or 15 accounts into the solution. And so I started to ask him, I was like, well, you know, what happens if, you know, all of our regular AD gets locked out? You know, what's the process, right? And he said, oh, I just go into global AD. I could reset them all right from there. I was like, okay, well, what happens if global AD gets locked out? You know, because if, if all of our normal AD gets locked out, more than likely that issue is going to reside also with global AD and, you know, it'll get locked out as well. And he said, oh, if that gets locked out, we're calling Microsoft. I was like, oh. So it's it's pretty serious then. So, you know, I ended up onboarding these global AD accounts. There's like 12 of them, but I set them all to not rotate. You know, that 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 was the idea. We're not going to rotate it right now. We're going to figure it out, you know, as we go. And, you know, of course, this wonderful solution that I was working with uh, that I refuse to work with to this day uh, decided to have a bug that we were not aware of it. And when you when you essentially selected an individual account to rotate the the database on the back end did not accept that filter and it applied it to every account in its database. And so, you know, this happened. One of our interns, you know, just did a normal BAU task, right? This user's having an issue with their password. It's out of sync. Let's just reset it and call it a day. So 15 second task, you know, literally they do it every single day, all day long. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as soon as that happened, like my account got locked out. I'm like, well, that's weird. I mean, I did just reset my password because it was it, it was that time of the quarter for me. You know, it was very odd coincidence. I'm like, OK, well, surely, you know, nothing's going on here. And then I see out of the corner of my eye. My coworker also had the same, you know, pop up. It's time to change your password. I'm like, okay. And so I went, you know, back over to the console because now I, I can't get into my computer for some reason. Once you, you know, lock it, literally the process is you lock your computer, you put in the current password, and then you reset it. Well, my current password had changed. So I locked it and I couldn't get back in. And uh, I went over to my coworker that was still in the console. And we looked at the last, you know, rotation period for all these accounts. And it was just, I mean, it was just firing through them. There's 45,000 accounts on this solution. And it's, I mean, it is chugging along. And I was like, oh, no, I have to go to the 12 global AD people and tell them to not log out of their computer. I mean, it's 4 p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> you know, like everyone is. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is like running out the door. You know, and I have to run into this room and say, like, OK, no one here is allowed to lock their computer. You cannot log out. If you do nothing else, you have to keep your computer awake, you know, and like it, it was it was the worst fire drill you can imagine, because now we have to, like, pull these passwords and set them back to their old value somehow, you know, and 
because you can't have all of your users all you know 10,000 of your users whatever it might be you know first thing in the morning oh you have to reset your your ad account password and you have to reset every service account password that you own and you know it's the service such accounts a mess. that's that's what's really going to kill you cuz they're almost never well documented so like it gets yeah. reset it's like all right where all is it trying to log in from cuz it keeps locking out even after we reset it on the boxes we knew about and then it's like a hunt so very yeah. catastrophic to production for sure. Yeah, I guess uh you know it's it's looking back on it it's funny because when that happened, you know, literally all of the service accounts, you know, 12,000 of them or something like that got reset almost instantly. There was no way to stop it. And oh. uh one one of one of uh one of the managers that I'm still friends with to to, to today he said, oh, on Monday, I got this project handed down from the CISO that we have to go, you know, team by team and reset all the service accounts. So I guess my project just got done, you know, in 10 seconds. <laughs> He's like, I guess I could close that out. I estimated that to take me two years. <laughs> oh, like, well, man. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's funny because like this is a problem like a lot of companies have with their service accounts and they're. They're, they're using creds that are 10, 15, I've, I've seen 20 year old credentials that are out there, right? You know, they're, 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 you're not even using curb for auth. Like it's, it's a hot mess, but no one wants to touch them because the last time those accounts got touched, you know, Joe got fired because we <laughs> didn't realize what it was doing to production. And now no one wants to go near it because they realize it could bore production. So it's like this, this hot potato that keeps getting tossed around project wise. Security doesn't want it because they don't want to mess up production. So they go to ops and ops doesn't want it because, well, this is a security thing. You're resetting passwords. So it just bounces around between different orgs until, you know, the new guy gets stuck with it. And that's not what anyone should want. Yeah. Even just trying to figure out what those service accounts manage and what they do is most of the time it's an impossible task because the people that created it, like literally that whole team can be retired, like not just yeah. like change jobs retired you know like um that that was the case for a lot of these accounts where you know people were like oh yeah we're just told not to touch that thing because it it does something with this database over here and you know whatever it might be like that that's literally the description that we're getting when we're going to these teams saying what does this do <laughs> no one knows no one knows you, you can get some data from from interviewing but you're not gonna be able to get uh everything uh, right. So I was I was at Microsoft and we got rid of WINS, right? So this is kind of a, a similar issue, right? This legacy technology has odd dependencies, and they literally hunted down at the network stack who all was using WINS. Period. Going to those machines and like being like, who owns this? We need to talk to them. <laughs> they hunted all of them down so there wouldn't be any impact. But it was a it was a huge project, and you know, I've, I've been on like projects where the service count rotation comes up because it's always a finding during uh, a security discoveries. It's like you have a cred that's been out here for 20 years. It's it's eight characters. Uh, there's there's a problem. It's well-known credentials. It's it's sitting in rock you. Like this, this is extremely vulnerable to password spray and it, it has either domain admin or server admin kind of across North America, kind of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, Back back when those accounts were being created, the easiest thing to do was to actually just give it, you know, global admin, right? Service admin, whatever it might be, just to make sure that it works. And a lot of the times the thought was, oh, we'll dial it in later, you know, mm -hmm. and, and now we're learning 30 years later, like, oh, that's a bad idea. We probably shouldn't do that because we never go back to it. Yeah, it's, it's tough. And it's it's really tough in like startups that grew exponentially from the, uh, I guess we're calling them the aughts, right? Now you start small, you're going fast, you're just doing whatever you have to do to be operational. And then next thing you know, you're a you know, multi-billion dollar company with an identity system that is almost completely unusable and mm -hmm. so porous from a security standpoint that it, it puts you at a significant financial risk, especially for these publicly traded companies now with the solar winds CISO uh, being, you know, taken to court by the SEC. Like there's there's skin in the game potentially now for these CISOs, like personal liability, not just job stuff. So it's it's going to be really interesting to see how that case um, turns out. It's, it's going to affect the industry, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. 
you know, I, I actually have a friend that's at a company that is still, you know, it still feels like they're in their, their startup phase. Uh, they've been around for maybe, you know, 10, I wouldn't be any more than 15 years. Um, and, and he said that when he took over as the IAM director, right, he was just trying to get a lay for the land and see what they had. Uh, you know, they were predominantly in Azure, right? So it shouldn't be that terrible. And he discovered that they had like over 400,000 accounts, you know, and they had accounts just sitting there, you know, not doing anything at all. And his first task was to, you know, obviously limit the attack surface across these accounts. Well, how do you, how do you do that? How do you even get started? You know, and I actually spent probably a week or two, I should have charged him some consulting fee because I spent like a week or two with him, you know, kind of devising this plan of how he can go about it without causing any outages. Yeah, that's the big one, not causing any outages. It's really easy to fix all the accounts. It's very difficult to fix them without causing any impact. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's challenging and the cloud doesn't really make it any easier, you know, because no. it, it probably... <sighs> I mean, it makes it more difficult because it, you're so easily able to attach these accounts to whatever you want in Azure, in AWS, um, you know, and, and it's just it's too easy for developers <laughs> to do that. Yeah, it's d double edged sword, right? So you can dev fast, you can move quick, but, you know, suddenly your, your test environment is now labeled production and you only had security controls in there for a test environment and now it's, it's being pushed to prod along with all of these vulnerabilities. The, the biggest thing for on-prem AD for the longest time and still today is developers choosing to use NTLM auth and instead of Curb, right? Uh, NTLM has been broken for a very, very, very long time now, uh, you know, over, over 15 years. Uh, V2 is pretty good, but you know, almost everyone has V1 uh, backwards compatibility turned on so their legacy apps continue to work so devs just hey let's do ntlm it's fast it's quick it's easy there's templates for it and we can get rolling and they sell the app and the company buys the app and they're like all right security team implement this and they're like wait this uses ntlm why are why did we buy this <laughs> <laughs> wait, this is going to be a huge problem and orgs especially larger orgs will often buy applications without security review they won't look at their dependencies. They won't look at you know how they're built from a security standpoint. They only look at, hey, this fixes this big problem and it's going to make us X amount of money or if it's going to save us Y amount of money. Security is very rarely a part of that conversation. Uh, and that's that's detrimental to, to all of these organizations. Yeah, that's a really good point. So you mentioned earlier, you know, that you worked for Microsoft, right? So can you talk to me a little bit about that experience, you know, what oh, it was sure. like to work for Microsoft at at least on one of their core products. I mean, I don't know if you were on the product team or if you were on, you know, another team that specializes in AD, right? But what is that like? Because that's a core technology that, you know, 95, 98% of every company out there uses as their directory service. I was at a, a weird, weird point in time for Microsoft. They had just figured out that, hey, as Android things getting really big, we need a Windows phone. So I was on the Win Phone project. Mm. And one of the issues they were, were having there is at the time, Microsoft was was very, very siloed. Like, you know, Office was a completely different team from OS, was a completely different team from uh, server. And like these orgs didn't really communicate with each other. Each one kind of functioned like a fast moving startup. And they all rolled their code up into a central repository. And this was especially true for WinPhone. It was supposed to be using the, the same code as uh, Windows 8, right? So you have a unified desktop phone experience. Conceptually good, but couldn't get anyone to dev for it. And we all know how the, the WinPhone ended, ended up turning out. Uh, it was a great phone, but no, no real adoption. Uh, so anyways, like it was a really interesting environment um, because from a technical standpoint, you couldn't do a lot of what you needed to without blessing from MSIT kind of the uh, the key holders for all the different teams. All the different teams have their own, you know, admins and architects. But at the end, like all of the access is controlled by MSIT. So it's 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 really interesting. Kind of kind of look at it as a, a company that buys other companies, ingests them, and continues to let them do their own thing. 
but occasionally sticks their finger in the pie. Uh, it's it's a very at the time combative environment, but uh, the people were really great. It was it was fun. It was a fun job. Hmm, that's really interesting. I wonder how that has played out with Azure now. Um, you know, just the nature of the cloud, right? You have this giant hypervisor that you know a ha- probably a handful of people actually have access to and how is that you know kind of administered and <laughs> managed and whatnot right like the i always think about it as like you know the the worst kind of attack for the, for any cloud would be to get access to that hypervisor and yeah there's you know there's environment escape exploits and things like that right but you know no one is actually logging directly into that hypervisor you know, from an attacker perspective, no one's actually logging into that thing and then seeing, you know, the tens of thousands of accounts that this cloud provider may have. I, I, I'm i always interested to see how they protect it. And I've done a little bit of research into Google and how they protect theirs. And I mean, from how they make it sound, there's like 12 people at Google that have access, you know, to a server in a data center that is like highly replicated across the globe you know, that gives us access and they uh, invoke some sort of just in time access for, you know, admins that need to access, you know, maybe a customer specific hypervisor. Yeah, it's it's interesting because with with all cloud providers, you don't really have physical separation. You have logical separation, but it's not physical. I mean, your virtual machine for your your active directory DC sitting out on the cloud could be on the same physical hypervisor as a, uh, a a VM owned by the CCP or uh, um, one of these ransomware groups because it's pretty easy to buy a hypervisor. So for for physical escapes, there's still very very edge case kind of stuff like Rohammer's been out for a while and there's all these CPU vulnerabilities that are flying around. Uh, but without physical isolation, you don't really have true security. Uh, and it's easy to go for the, the hypervisor route because, hey, look how much money we're, we're saving. We don't have to rack and stack something. And it's 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 great from a cost standpoint. And that's been true for a long time until the past couple of years when the, the large cloud providers realized, hey, we got these people like hook, line, and sinker. They can't just leave us without a huge project so we can raise our rates, right? This is a, the same thing kind of happened with Uber and Lyft. Like it was really cheap when you first started using Uber, like a, a nice, you know, town car picked you up for like $5, took you anywhere you want. And now you're in the back of like a, a beat up Prius that smells absolutely awful. And it's like third round of seat covers. Uh, and that's that's the prices going up in the, the the cloud environment. And it's tough for a lot of our larger customers because they feel stuck and they feel manipulated and they feel controlled. And they don't like that. And large companies can make a make a switch very quickly if the wrong person gets pissed off. Uh, not the one Fortune 100 I'm, I'm thinking of in particular, there's a, a rumor of a, uh, a backyard barbecue in Redmond. And uh, they were talking with some Microsoft reps there. And there may have been a few drinks that have happened at this barbecue. This is all alleged second information. So I can't uh, I can't validate its authenticity. But apparently the Microsoft rep said, well, you don't have any other option. We're the only game in town. And uh, it pissed the other guy off. And six months later, they were on GCP. Wow. <laughs> that is, uh, that's, that's substantial. You, you know, like you have to, I feel like when you're, when you're in that sort of situation, you have to gauge, you know, what kind of personality not just that you're you're dealing with, you know, in that individual, right? You got to think about the personality of the person in that role, you know, what it takes to actually get into that role. You know, like let, let's just, let's just assume, right? It's a CIO, CTO, something like that, right? What's the kind of personality of a person that is typically in that role? Someone, <laughs> you know, that doesn't like to be told no. Someone that probably <laughs> takes you know that sort of wording as a challenge you know and now now you're in the situation of you're losing probably one of your biggest customers because of a sales rep yeah that had uh maybe one too many drinks at a barbecue it's uh it's a very silly way to lose a very big contract yeah i mean that's a that's a really stupid way to get fired (laughs) yeah I, i i don't know what happened to the guy that uh that caused the whole thing but i have to imagine he's not working there anymore (laughs) yeah probably not (laughs) i mean (laughs) 
well, what other solution are they left with at that point? Like, man. Yeah, that- yeah. And I'm seeing other other clients do do similar things, right? They're not going all in on one provider. They're kind of dipping dipping a foot in provider A, dipping a foot in provider B, and even setting up pretty interesting failover. So if provider A goes down for whatever reason, they can hot swap back over to B for some redundancy. But it also gives them cost negotiation, right? Because now they can suddenly go, oh, hey, provider A, well, provider B is charging us 40% less for this. I, I think we're just going to move our stuff over there. And then suddenly there's room for negotiation and price of services. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. You know, I, I've seen it from multiple angles, I feel. And, you know, I was at a company that, you know, they were a Microsoft shop from, from the beginning. Um, and they bought pretty much everything that Microsoft sold. If, if Microsoft sold it, they bought it, you know, it, it wasn't even a question. Like it always seemed like we had an unlimited budget when it came to Microsoft. But when we were talking about like Symantec, right. Symantec, like EDR, which isn't even an EDR, which is terrible. You know, it's solo on the magic quadrant at that time. You know, I don't know about the product now, but at that time it wasn't even considered a top tier EDR and we're penny pinching you know, this solution that we desperately need um, that isn't even supposed to be that great, right? And their whole their whole Azure, you know, methodology was if we only want network closets on-prem, the rest of it will live in Azure forever and we're not going to migrate away from it. And I, you know, I, I just asked them, I was like, well, what if there's something that like Microsoft does that we can't live with? You know, like, what if some insider threat happens at Microsoft and, you know, we have a lot of proprietary information that makes a lot of really wealthy people even more wealthy because it's a it's a financial firm. It's a investment firm. Right. So, like, we have a lot of proprietary stuff. And what if, you know, all of our eggs in one basket and someone breaches it. Right. And takes that information without us knowing. And they're like, oh, well, that will never happen. It's like, well, what, ah. if it, what if it does? Because, you know, there's there's one account for for each of the big three cloud providers where something very suspicious happened, you know, where a new startup is creating some new product on, you know, X cloud. Right. And then magically right out of the blue, just before you're about to launch, that cloud provider launches this exact same solution exact same interface with a different logo and now you're out of business before you even hit the street you know if you want true security it has to be physical you can't have shared infrastructure and security uh coexist it's just not the same physical boxes will always be more secure than any sort of hypervisor not because there's active vulnerabilities for for vmware hyper v or or anything but because there's always the potential for those active vulnerabilities i mean look at how many cves have existed for citrix throughout the years seems like every six months we hit a new uh, publicly facing uh, cve that's like oh yeah they can pivot to domain admin from the cloud (laughs) they can pivot (laughs) to domain admin from the the admin interface as this configuration like there's risk to opening those things up and over the past couple years we've seen the, the the penalties to that right all of these network devices that are opened up, you know, Okta, I mean, it, the, the list goes on and on. So if you, you really, if security is number one and it matters for the core of your business and your existence, maybe on-prem those, right? Because there's always a possibility on shared infrastructure that if someone else has the keys that your your proprietary information is going to go for a walk. I, uh, you don't see hmm. Coke storing their magic recipe in the cloud, right? Yeah, that... Uh... That would not be a good situation. That's for sure. You know, like I, I actually had um, someone on previously that 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 wrote a book um, about how oh James Lawler, that's his name, uh, about how you know this is a, a fictitious you know scenario or whatever. But I always question how fictitious it actually is because of his background. You know, he was actually a spy for the cia right mm-hmm. and so it's not his book it's a is hypothetical a, it's a hypothetical yeah, it's, it's a <laughs> hypothetical with strong quotations around it you know because i'm 
I'm literally reading his book and I'm like, man, this is all like very, just so probable, you know? And in one of the books, you know, the, the agency moves into one of the big cloud providers, right? He used a different name, but it sounded like AWS in my opinion, maybe because I'm an AWS guy, right? Um, and sure enough, foreign adversaries immediately start tar- targeting the employees at this cloud provider. And, you know, it it leads me down this thought path of, you know, the employees at these cloud providers, they're typically pretty well paid. I mean, everything that I've seen, they're pretty well paid. And so for, for a foreign adversary to come into this situation and offer up, you know, a check of like, oh, you know, you want your year yearly salary and one check, like, well, here you go. We just need this little script to run, you know, that's 10 lines. We needed to run on your core server or whatever it is, you know, I, I feel like that's a very real possibility. And even me being a cloud guy now, you know, I, I only do the cloud as far as I'm concerned in my company on-prem doesn't exist. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, I, I always have that paranoia of, well, how do we protect something that doesn't reside on hardware that we do not own that we cannot go physically pull the plug on? How do we ensure, you know, that even insider threat is, you know, protected against in this scenario? It's tough. I mean, uh, look at look at Stuck, Stuxnet, right? So there's information is coming out fairly recently that it looks like a, a, a Dutch person was working for, for Stuxnet and floated in a USB through the, the water system and then got that into the, uh, into the, uh, the software. Um, but, and that's a completely air gapped, physically locked environment. And they still were able to get a USB stick in there and, and plug it in and, and run, run Stuxnet. So there's always going to be the risk of that physical layer being traversed, even in extreme environments, which is why defense in depth is so important. If, if there'd been policy set up, for that um, environment that didn't allow USB drives to be attached, that would have never happened. And that's that really straightforward, simple, basic policy that no one is probably worried about. It's because, hey, we're in this high security environment. Everyone gets searched before they come in. There's no way a USB stick can make its way in. And it it did. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the defense in depth has a lot of a lot of pros there to help mitigate risk, but you'll, you'll never remove it completely. Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> you know, when I... When I did some government work earlier on in my career, um, I've been in some very uncomfortable situations where, you know, I, I answered a last minute phone call on my cell phone in their lobby, you know, and I mean, the, the these guys, these security guards that they have, I mean, they're they're larger than life. They look like they used to play, you know, collegiate football, right? They look like they could separate your head from your body, you know, in, a, in the blink of an eye. Right. And I mean, they see this cell phone go off. I think they they have to have some sort of monitor or something, you know, like but behind their desk that like goes off if a cell phone is in use. Um, because like, I mean, I sent a text, you know, and they were on top of me. They were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm in the lobby, man. Like, I'm literally cleared to be here. You know, it took me a day to get clearance to be here. <laughs> you guys know who I am. <laughs> And they're like, no, you have to go out the front door like right now. If you make that mistake again, like we're going to arrest you. <laughs> you know, it's like, geez, like where the hell am I? Yeah, it's 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 interesting. So when you start talking about high security or, or, or gov, uh, the, the air gap is treated very seriously for a lot of those uh, environments. Um, I was part of a team that did a uh, rollout, a secure uh, actor directory forest deployment for a completely air gapped environment that had to be able to send out the data periodically. And the, the solution here hmm. was uh, pretty pretty interesting. There was, there was one machine that was set up with uh, dual, dual sets of very high throughput NICs. And basically, because the data set that needed to come out wasn't massive, uh, but it was, it was sizable. So when the data needed to come out, uh, it was moved to this temporary holding pattern. They called it a, a lock server. And then the data was transferred from that server to an intermediary. And then the connection was severed and it was connected back to the internal network. And then that intermediary then moved the data to 
production and then had its network connection severed. So they were air gapped uh, logically um, by uh, network throughput, right? And you needed two people to basically open the network, uh, which was a pretty, pretty interesting solution for, for something that had to stay uh, safe. Huh. While I it was wonder, being developed. I wonder what that would have even been because like, you know, when you say it takes two people to do this thing, you know, you're not able to do it without it. I mean, the very first thing that comes to my mind is, well, what else in the government works like that, that we know of? Oh, nuclear missile silos. <laughs> you know, like, that's, yeah. that's the yeah, only yeah. other thing that I know of, you know, that operates like that, where it's like, okay, we need these two people. And if we don't have the two people, like, we're screwed. Right, yeah, like the, I, the nukes, the nukes get a lot of publicity <laughs> because of all the the, the movies, right? But um, right. there's use cases for this in the wild, even in in, in public companies for unlocking you know, basically oh. great glass creds. You need more than one person to to turn the key. Okay, yeah, I've I've seen solutions like that where it's like a just in time access, you know, with Azure, where you have some you know global admin account or something like that, and someone else needs to approve it, and you get multiple approvers, you know, right? Yeah, you get a certain amount of time to actually use the account, and everything is logged and watched. Um, yep, screen recording for the full session, all that good stuff. Yeah, but you know, we kind of we kind of glossed over it, and maybe that's it's the most uh, interesting part for me. Is the the Stuxnet water USB thing? So so what what recently came out? Because I uh, I'm 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 been very fascinated by Stuxnet, you know the uh, engineering, the ingenuity that went into it, uh, everything around it, you know it, it just fascinates me, right? It's kind of what what even pulled my interest into security. That was the thing oh. that I was like, oh, so I can literally spend my entire life. And, you know, not learn everything. Right. So so what's this uh, what's this water USB infiltration well, the, uh, method? The, the original the original story was that it was USB seated in the parking lot. Someone picked one up and, and plugged it in somewhere. Perfectly plausible story. Um, and relatively recently, there was some information that came out. I can't verify its authenticity. It's just an article. Right that it was a, a Dutch contractor working at the facility that was uh, being being paid for this, right? And they they received some sort of monetary reward or maybe it was a service, who, who knows what it was, uh, but they, they used a water inlet allegedly to smuggle in this USB because they were part of the cooling area that they knew very well. And they were able to get something physical that floated in, into the facility. And because they were able to do that, uh, they just were able to plug it in and because of the way Stuxnet worked, uh, it spread far and wide very quickly, and it's very hard to tell where it came from originally. Wow. Yeah, that, you know, that's the part that that always kind of got me hung up was actually infiltrating the, the USB in, right? Because, I mean, I've I've been to, you know, secured facilities that are not at the same level as that facility would be. And I was patted down and I had to go through, you know, some special scanner that, you know, takes an uncomfortable depth of look into me. You know, like they'll know I, I have like cancer, for instance, like before my doctor will know, you know, like uh, it's. Uh, yeah, you don't want that guy to tell you to, hey, go get checked out on your way out, you know, <laughs> go see yeah, your they, doctor, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you, know, you got a lump. <laughs> you're right. It's like, oh, you. Yeah, when you say see you later, he says maybe that's that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it, like the, well, that's that's the part that like I always had issue with because I mean I, I couldn't I couldn't get anything past these guys, right? And I wasn't again I wasn't actively trying to. You know, I didn't want to end up in handcuffs. I I do like my freedom, um, but. Still, you know, thinking through it, it's like, okay, well, there has to be an insider threat somewhere, you know, that that's allowing this thing in. Um, but bypassing it through the water system, I mean, that is something that's because uh, who's going to who's going who's gonna to check it, right? Who's going to you know, filter the incoming water to make sure there's right. not floating USB sticks in it? <laughs> right. Real, real edge case stuff, man. But there's almost always like a way in. 
And that's a that's a pretty good example of it. And uh, I, I'll, I'll give you another one. Right. So the, those the scanners you keep talking about. So for I did lots of consulting. So for years, I would I would fly I'd fly and my uh, my poor backpack finally gave up the ghost one day. The strap broke. So I, <laughs> I, I grabbed my wife's and I started flying. I didn't think anything of it. And I was flying for like two, almost three years. And the, the backpack went off in a scanner. I was having like already a bad day. Uh, things kind of went sideways uh, with a client like it was not a great situation. So I'm already like irritated, which doesn't justify what happens next, but it's just like a precursor on, I'm not a bad person. Let me, let me add some, some, uh, some story here. So I go through security, been through the security, of this backpack many, many, many times, like two or three years of traveling and it flags. All right, whatever, go through the random check and it's fine. And we got to send your bag back through. All right, whatever. They send the bag back through. They're looking through it like really extensively. I have the whole thing inside it out, everything else like separated individually on the table. So I'm getting a little irritated. I got like another like five or 10 minutes for it to be anywhere. So it's fine. And they send it through again, same rigmarole. And they call some new people over I'm like, hey, what's going on here, guys? I've been using this bag for almost three years now. Can I can I get to my flight? And everyone there was like really sympathetic with me, except for this one person who's just like, there's something in this bag. I just know it. So they send it through like two more times. And eventually their face just lights up and they reach into the bag and like they're really in there. And they pull out a box knife that I had no idea was in there because my wife used to work at Target, you know, 10 years ago. And it was her bag. And it had been in there for almost three years and the TSA never caught it. So, like, wow. even pretty good systems don't always work. Yeah, I, I hesitate to call the TSA a good system. Um <laughs> Well, it beats nothing, I suppose. <laughs> yes, it, it does beat nothing. Um, the reason the reason is because, like, I read some report by uh, what was it? It was like the the federal air marshals or something like that, where they actually test, you know, if TSA is going to catch something or whatnot, right? I'm and, sure they were able to get in, no issue, right? Yeah, they. I mean, they said that they were able to like smuggle guns through TSA and knives and. You know, they said that there was basically no limit to it. Like they could get through anything that they wanted. And TSA, it was a staggering amount. It was something like 96, 97 percent of the time TSA would let it through. And oh, I mean, another people, example. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but I uh, I long story. I, I was flying. I was in Atlanta to visit my uh, my, my grandfather. And he had this like really like old school pair of like sewing. So there's like huge, meaty, like giant scissors and without thinking about it i just threw them on my backpack went to the airport you know i on the plane going into my pouch kind of you know looking for a snack and i see these gigantic metal scissors i'm like how did tsa not find this this looks like a huge knife on the x-ray right like yeah, they're it's... huge there's, there's no way to miss this <laughs> like this big <laughs> yeah it, it's uh it's crazy but they'll find the water bottle you know that you oh, forgot yeah. was full They'll get, yeah. they'll get that every time, but they, <laughs> they won't get the weapon. Like it's, oh, they'll also uh, get your energy bars because you if you take more than like a like a half dozen energy bars on a trip, apparently it looks like a plastic explosive at the bottom of your bag. What? <laughs> yeah. So I uh, I eat a lot of energy bars. They're convenient food on the go. I'll just throw yeah. them all in the bottom of my bag and then head off. And uh, I I don't do this anymore because like I got stopped and it was like the whole rigmarole search, big delay. And then they like, call some other people out to look through the bag real carefully. And it's just like, those are just like cliff bars, guys. Come on. <laughs> What's going on here? Wow. You know, James, we 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 just went like 44 minutes, right? And we didn't even talk oh. about your your company. <laughs> you know, oh, so yeah. let, let's uh let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now, you know, what what the company is and everything like that, what services you provide. And we'll dive into that. Oh, sure. So uh, I, I founded DSC back in 2019 after doing a lot of work for the big four. And I kept kind of asking myself, like, why isn't there a smaller organization doing Active Directory security like this? I mean, there's there's no reason to pay all this overhead for the big four, you know, financing their, their leases and their 30-foot oak tables and all their commercial real estate when we could start an org without those things and offer a better price to our customers with the same quality of service. So like, let's do it. So we, we, we founded in 19 and that's kind of what I've been doing uh, ever since transitioning from being highly technical to the 
absolute uh, uh, battlefront that is trying to be a, a leader and a mentor. It's a, it's a much, much different job, but it's been very fun. And I've learned just a, a ton over the past couple of years. But we, as I alluded to, we specialize in a security run active director. We have a active directory security health assessment program, our AD Shaw. Basically, we use a lot of the, the tools threat actors use. We, we come in as if we were a threat actor. We, we show you where the holes are. We prioritize them by you know, difficulty to resolve and criticality. So you can kind of prioritize because you're not going to be able to fix everything. No one is. It's, it's impossible to fix everything. But you got to get the big stuff, right? The main arteries, anything that's critical, you know, get those solved. And that's going to prevent the majority of, of the threat actors. And not every threat actor is an APT, right? A, a lot of them are, are newer and amateurish at best, and they're just using off-the-shelf tools. And if you can stop the majority of those, it gives you a much better chance uh, against the, the the APTs and the more um, you know, financed uh, threat actor groups that are out there. Uh, in addition to that, we do uh, AD migrations as well, kind of an emphasis on security there. A lot of orgs will just dump everything from point A to point B. And that really is a recipe to bring some pretty bad exploits into your environment if you, you don't know what you're, what you're doing. Anyone can migrate a, a directory environment. Doing it without compromising the the final destination that is that is kind of the uh, the sticky part. Uh, that's hmm. who we are, uh, and that's that's what we do. Uh, and if you you want to reach out, uh, we're on dsc.team and, and LinkedIn, and you know obviously uh, the the social gambit there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I, I have a question around the mentality of starting a consulting company, right? So. You know, I, I started mine in 2019 and, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have a couple customers here and there. And, you know, when, when I, when I started it, I was like, okay, you know, this is, this is stupid. Nothing's going to come of it. Who would trust me, you know, to pay me right to come in and give them any sort of advice. They probably already have the experts internally, right? What am I doing? Imposter Um, syndrome, man. It's powerful. Yeah, a- absolutely. I, and I'm glad I still went forward with it, right? Like I still, you know, went down that path and still did it and everything else like that. Right. But how do you how do you overcome that? You know, because I, I feel like it might have been a little bit different if it existed for you at all. Right. Because you worked for Microsoft and now you're starting a consulting firm that specializes in AD, AD security. Right. So, I mean, at least for me. Right. Like if I was going to start a consulting firm at AWS and I already like worked for AWS, like, I don't know, maybe I would feel like, okay, like I got this thing, you know, there's nothing that they can ask, ask me that I won't be able to answer. But, you know, did you experience anything like that or was it, was it a different sort of feeling for you? No, I I think I'm pretty sure everyone gets imposter syndrome. It's just not everyone admits they have imposter syndrome. It's, it's scary, Hmm. man. It's scary, but you you have to kind of just take yourself and what I do this works for me and your mileage may vary. I just throw myself into the fire, right? Whatever the new thing is, I'm just going to put myself in a situation where I have to learn it and I have to figure it out. And typically I come out of that on top or I, I learn something. And either way, you know, that's that's a win and a long enough uh, time horizon. But it's tough, right? It's tough to put yourself in a situation where you're you're giving answers as the expert early in your career because you may only have like a couple years of experience, right? You may only know what you know, and and that's okay, right? That's how you learn. Go out there and, and make mistakes. Take that job you you don't think you're qualified for, and just learn the crap out of it, and really better yourself in your career. There, it's hard. It can be very stressful. Um, I've certainly had plenty of stress running a running a business, uh, like actual physical problems from the stress, like heart issues, <laughs> uh, you know, hair loss, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like you stress yourself out enough and your body will, will make you slow down. You won't have a choice in it. And that's kind of how I, I find my limits is when I, I run up against that wall. I'm like, okay, well, I, I physically can't go on. I need to dial it back and get more intelligent about how I'm, how I'm doing this, but absolutely imposter syndrome every single day of my life. Uh, it's, it's always there. And uh, I- I'm thankful for it because I-, I think it motivates me to a certain extent to be better because there's always someone smarter, uh, faster, better, stronger, more wealthy out there. And uh, the goal is to try and catch up to them as quickly as you can, in my opinion. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to overcome, you know, that just getting into that mentality of, OK, I don't know what I'm doing today, 
but tomorrow I'm going to know more than what I do today. You know, and that's <laughs> positive. That's positive movement. You know, that's going in the right direction. It's really difficult to kind of get into that mentality and just accept it and be like, okay, I'm not going to know everything, but I can find out. And I think that was, I think that was the biggest thing for me when I got those first couple of customers. You know, I was providing consulting on a solution that personally I hate. I absolutely hate everything about the solution. I wish I didn't get the experience that I did because even even to this day, you know, I get calls of people being like, oh, do you want to work on this solution? Just name your number. I'm like, no, I I actually have no interest in, in doing anything with this solution. Um, and and. You know, one of I, I think one of the one of the biggest selling points was, hey, I, I know, you know, all the key players at this company. If I literally cannot figure it out, I'm gonna go ask the guy that made it, you know, and get you the answer that you need. And that was something that no one else was able to offer them, you know, because you have all these other bigger consulting firms that are kind of more reliant on the the internal talent and skills and you know, that internal talent and skills is getting trained by the experts that built it, but they still don't have that, uh, you know, that connection to where they can go and ask that person, you know, on demand, like, hey, what is this thing? What is it doing? What's the snippet of code? How do I get around it? Things like that. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting mentality that you have to have, I feel, to to feel like you're capable, <laughs> you know, of of providing services that are worth money to a to some company that can you know dissolve your company overnight yeah yeah i mean uh absolutely like working with some larger organizations like you know, fortune fortune 500s fortune 100s it's very scary because you you and your you know entity of like 50 people are are a rounding error to them right if there's any sort of you know legal issue it, it doesn't matter if you're in the right or wrong they're going to outspend you so all yeah. you can do is do do the right thing, do as much of it as you can and do as, as best as you can. And it's been working out so far for me. Uh, growing up without a lot of extra money helped with this mentality of figure it out because, uh, you know, when I was really young, it was, hey, my car's broken. Well, I can't afford to have it fixed, so I better figure it out, right? Pick up a yeah. wrench, order some, order some parts, and okay, let's figure out how this thing goes together. It's just like Legos, right? Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh... It's a skill set that helps you in a lot of different areas. Um, at least that's that's my opinion of it. But uh, you know, James, I'm I'm I always try to stay on top of my time uh with all of my guests, you know, because I know everyone's time is very valuable and whatnot. But, you know, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I, I feel like we could easily go another two, three hours, you know, and not even <laughs> break a sweat. Um but you know that just means that I'm going to have to have you on in the future. Uh, Anytime, you know, to man. Talk it was about fun. More, you know, we we can talk about anything. We can bring you on and talk about cyber news or anything like that. But you know, it's a fantastic conversation. I definitely really enjoyed it. And uh, before I before I let you go, how about you tell my audience, you know, where they can find you if they wanted to reach out to you, where they can find your company, uh, you know, what all that information is, so that they can you know reach out if they wanted. I uh, just, you know, go out to your, your favorite browser and uh, dse.team, that's a uh, Delta Sierra Echo, uh, just dot .team. And all of our contact information is out there. You can get a hold of us by phone, email, LinkedIn, you know, Twitter, whatever your, your preference of communication is. And uh, we, we'd be happy to talk to you and, and help with whatever you got going on. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode.